I had absolutely zero expectations heading into Elimination Chamber Sunday night. And I suppose that's the trick now, isn't it, WWE? Set the bar so low, no expectations. That way, if you do anything at all, people feel great about it. Feel great about themselves and feel great about the WWE product. An ingenious plan for sure. But at least I can say, with the Elimination Chamber show and having two chamber matches, the fact that those two matches are going to take up a lion's share of the time, you know a night like this is going to go by relatively quickly. And even though the WWE still had to go over three hours for the main card, ultimately, if you could get through the meaningless shit in the middle, it was a show that went by pretty smoothly and pretty quickly. Thank God. Ugh. The women's elimination chamber match kicking off the show, I don't think was a surprise. It was where it needed to be. And with this match, it really was one of those examples of predictable but sensible. Like after the first two ladies start, you know this person's coming in, then that person's coming in, that Alexa's not coming in until last, Sasha's going to turn on Bailey at some point in time, they're going to fight, and Alexa's going to find a way to retain her title. Like you knew that going in. And predictable can be boring, but predictable can also be sensible. It can still be the right thing to do. And ultimately, for this most part, this match was the right thing to do. It was okay. To me, honestly, it was just kind of there, but not a lot for me to praise and not a lot for me to rant and rave about. The only thing I was questioning or wondering was why Alexa would attack Bailey after she had just taken out Sasha. You would think you would want to try and pin the person that's already down first, then go after Bailey, but eh, whatever, did it really matter? Uh, the promo afterwards by Alexa was very good. It shows why she's one of the best women's talents, and sometimes you might argue one of the best talents, period, on the WWE roster. History's made whoop the frickin' do. Started with the shit in the middle, Titus Worldwide versus The Bar for the Raw Tag Team Championships. There was nothing that they could do to make me care about this match, and I know I'm not alone. And, of course, it figures that the white guy and the even whiter guy would beat the black team in Black History Month. They get the shortest month of the year. We can't throw them a frickin' bone here. <laughs> Pleasant surprise of the night was Asuka versus Nia Jax. I really, really actually enjoyed this match quite a bit. Quite a bit. It was physical. It was stiff. It looked like these two ladies were dishing out some legit punishment. Like they were doing this the hard way. And it was refreshing. You know, you kind of, with a lot of these... Women's matches on Raw and SmackDown and WWE, you get a bunch of kind of daintiness to it with some awkward spots kind of thrown in. Not this one. This was physical. This was ass-kicking. This was really, really good. You know, it was easily my favorite match of the night. Now, it would have been better if we hadn't seen this match several times before between Raw, NXT, what have you. It also would have been much better if this match was actually saved for WrestleMania. Like, if you're going to go with the irresistible force and the immovable object type of stuff, then that's a type of story and hook that you use for a WrestleMania. It's a shame this type of match was squandered at Elimination Chamber. And it's weird to me. Nia Jax gets the Lady Braun treatment where she loses, which was a surprise in and of itself. Why not do some type of double countout, double DQ? Why have to have Nia lose here? But then she rampages and rages afterwards and beats the shit out of Asuka, spears her through the freaking barrier around the ring, what have you. But ultimately, at some point in time, it loses its impact. At some point in time, you get a diminishing return. It does no good to build people up like monsters on the one hand. Then on the other hand, they're tapping out the fucking Sasha Banks multiple times on Raw. And then in the big matches, they still freaking lose. Just because you could have a clear winner here doesn't mean you should. And no, the finish didn't save this for me. Yes, yes. 
Woken Matt Hardy versus Bray Wyatt. The only thing that was broken here was the sheer number of toilet seats that people were rushing to sit on as they dropped a dukester instead of watching this damn match. At least it was strategically placed about in the middle of the show because that's all this was, was a designated poop break. Now granted, I was digging the hell out of that Bray Wyatt, what you mean child support face. But so much of what is bad about WWE today was epitomized in this match. Two guys, two talents, two performers with two characters that be, should be so much, way freaking much more stuck in this quagmire of suck that is this storyline, that is this feud that does nothing to help either one of these guys, makes both of them worse off, and continues to drive fans away from both of them. And yes, while the fans are chanting Happy Rusev Day, and maybe the beach balls are stupid, this whole goddamn thing is stupid. And if WWE doesn't want people to do that, then be better, because this, 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 should have been so much better. Now, make it stop. It's over. And then, we can finally do this to this whole feud in our memory banks. Delete! 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 For the love of God! Delete! Delete! Oh, good Lord. The Ronda Rousey contract signing. This thing had train wreck written all over it. Praise God! Pay-per-view or not, bitches! You can see this God. You can believe in this God. You can see the miracles that he makes happen, not some guy upstairs that you can't even see. This God makes sure even on a pay-per-view, he gets a minimum 15-minute promo segment because ultimately, what matters as much as anything else on the road to WrestleMania is getting trips his WrestleMania match in his seven-figure payout. Because that is the majesty and the magnificence of the divinity that is God. Hugga. That's what matters. Now here's what else matters. Is who in the blue is the blue fucks decided it was a good idea to give Ronda Rousey a live mic and throw her out there like that. Ding dong, dumb dicks. Might not be the best time to just throw her to the freaking wolves. Because you could tell that she was nervous as shit. She was uncomfortable as hell. And then when the crowd actually got behind her a little bit, she got all off base and emotional and all this other crap. And you're trying to sell her as the baddest woman on the planet. <laughs> He's a bitch crazy. Give me a freaking break. Also, what the hell was up with Kurt Angle's sniveling snitch routine? Oh, they did this. Oh, they did that. Oh, they did that. Like, what the fuck is going on here? Some sniveling rivalry crap. It was ridiculous. And this whole time, this promo segment is descending into a quagmire of suck. And then Ronda Rousey throws Triple H through a table. And it's like, this is what the fuck we should have gotten to the damn point 10, 15 minutes ago. Now that said, since she has made the assault on God, that means God can now pedigree Ronda Rousey at WrestleMania, right? Right? Oh, I'm sure the feminazis would be all over that one. But here's what else was really funny to me. And actually made the whole segment work and maybe really changed my perspective on it. Stephanie bitch slapped the fuck out of Ronda Rousey. Like, that's one of the stiffest slaps I've seen in a long fucking time. She put them uh, mom arms to work and fucking laid wood. I was actually impressed that Ronda Rousey was still standing after her because we know what happens when she takes her right hand to the face. Ooh, I went there. She smacked the shit out of her. And as I watched Stephanie McMahon and Ronda Rousey, of course Stephanie's not getting her come up. It's because we're going to milk that all the way to WrestleMania. But I actually looked at it and I said, you know what? In a straight up fist fight, I might take Stephanie. And you know what's funny? A lot of you probably would too. So this ended up working for me on an entirely different plane in an entirely different level than I thought it was going to. But please stop giving Ronda Rousey a damn live mic. Not a good idea, especially right now. That brings us to the main event of the night, as it should have been, 
the men's elimination chamber match. The winner goes on to face Brock Lesnar at the WrestleMania. And we've also reached the point in time in the review that no matter what I say, the Roman Reigns lovers are going to shit on it because I'm too negative. And the Roman Reigns haters are going to sit there and call me a fucking WWE fanboy. So you know what? Fuck all of you. I'm going to say whatever the fuck I want. You don't like it. Eat shit. Go watch one of these other kiss-ass channels. The moment we finally waited for, for almost a year, has finally come. And you all knew, had to know. You had to know. Even if you wanted to throw out other possibilities and other contingencies, you had to know that when it comes to the golden children of Vince McMahon, no plan is ever wrong. No plan needs to be changed. And you've got to give this crazy son of a bitch this in the face of logic and reason and so many other factors that say, hey, ding dong dum dick, this might not be the best way to go for your WrestleMania main event. He stayed with it. He had this plan for a year, and by God, he saw it through. And as much as we've talked about over the years with Vince McMahon and his knee-jerk reflex reactions and dropping shit and not planning anything out a month ahead of time, let alone three months ahead of time, let alone 12 months ahead of time, he knew last year what he wanted for the main event this year. And by God, we got it. Now, I actually had fun watching the actual match itself. I enjoyed the match. Was not great, but it was enjoyable. And to me, the greatest thing about it is you've got Braun Strowman smashing and doing all these incredible things. And the whole time I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, man, every single person he eliminates is just going to make Roman Reigns look that much better when he fucking eliminates him and wins the damn match. And lo and behold, what the hell else did you think was going to happen? And the reactions were very split to this. Imagine that on social media last night. You got the crowd that's talking about, this isn't the same old shit. They had a good match three years ago. They can have another good one, da, da, da. This is literally the same main event you had three years ago. And it's not just a reflection of Roman Reigns of Brock Lesnar. It's just a reflection of the WWE as a whole. We get tired of the same old shit. So if a guy being in the WrestleMania main event for the fourth straight year, facing a guy he faced three years ago for a world title at WrestleMania in the main event, isn't the same old shit, then what the fuck is? Especially for so many people that have had to live through all the dark years of C-Nation and hustle, loyalty, respect, and all that. You can't see me bullshit. Now they get the Samoan SWAT team version of them. Of course it's the same old shit. It's Vince stubbornly thinking that no matter what, this is his dude. And it's ridiculous. And what more could you say? It's also ridiculous from the Braun Strowman standpoint. Because there is something to be said about sometimes you have to strike while the iron is hot. And eventually, if Braun loses too many big matches and doesn't go over at the right place in the right time in the right way, then he will start to decrease in terms of his value as a performer. See the Wade Barrett's and the Rybacks. Just a couple of examples. See Bray Wyatt as a perfect example of that. I fundamentally disagree with anybody saying, take your time, you don't have to rush. In theory, yes, that, that would be great. And I've always been a big proponent of the slow, gradual push for a lot of guys. But sometimes you can accelerate that freaking growth curve. And to me, this is somewhat similar, in a much worse fashion, of course, to the buildup of Sting and Hogan in 97, leading to Starcade 97. Like Bischoff and crew spent a whole year, they were building towards Sting Hogan, building towards Sting Hogan. It was absolutely the right call for business. But along the way in 97, here comes freaking Luger and he's hot as shit. And you've now gotten to a point in time where the fans will be perfectly fine with him winning the world title. So WCW Bischoff Hogan made the right freaking call, put the strap on Luger. The fans popped tremendously. You validated Luger in the eyes of the fans and how hot he was at the time. And you were 
were able to take the belt right off of him six days later. It took no steam, no momentum away from Sting Hogan whatsoever. It was just a temporary blip on the radar that ended up being really good business. And this is where you'll wonder if they really made the mistake not putting the belt on Braun back in the summer or the fall. I'm still not the biggest fan of his at this point. That said, though, I'm smart enough to recognize the reactions that he's getting on a consistent basis, and he has gotten over as the baby face you could only dream of Roman Reigns being able to get over as. You could have already had him be world champion. Drop it back. It would have helped him. It would have cemented him. Given him a real reason to rage. Now he's just freaking raging, and there's not really a point or purpose, which is appropriate for WWE. Wait too long, and it will be too late. But the real funny thing about this is, as much as everybody's going to crap on Roman, and everybody's going to shit on Roman, the real truth of the matter is, as boring as you might think Roman Reigns is, it doesn't nearly match up to the sheer boredom that comes with a Brock Lesnar Universal title reign. The best thing about this match at WrestleMania is we know no bullshit, no doubt, that Brock is dropping that dra damn strap and not a moment too soon. Thank freaking God! Ugh! Tired of this part-time champ bullshit. Tired of everything that is the same about his freaking presentation that has been the past several years. Uh, and for those dumb dicks that are sitting there talking about, well, they should transition Paul Heyman into Ronda Rousey. No! Fuck that! Do something different with her. Do something original with her. Don't do some freaking knockoff, generic, rip-off version of this bullshit because the real truth is when it comes to Paul Heyman, the best and only really great business he's ever done in WWE as a manager is with Brock Lesnar. Most everything else he's touched that wasn't managing Brock Lesnar has absolutely sucked on screen, and that's a fact, Jack. So I can't wait for Brock Lesnar to drop that goddamn drop at WrestleMania, and hopefully he's gone and gone for good. Because you've sensed past the point of relevancy and return on the investment with this guy. His title reign has ended up being boring as bricks. It's time has come. It is time to end it. And if that means I have to choke down freaking Roman Reigns winning that belt at WrestleMania, then so fucking be it. Because it is clearly, to me, the lesser of two evils. That's it. I'm done talking about Elimination Chamber. Let me know what you thought about the show in the comment section below. Click that thumbs up button if you actually like what I had to say. Or even if you didn't, I don't care. Subscribe to the damn channel. And remember, OTRS Central. Not the wrestling show you want. Just the wrestling show you need.